welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. And Julia, you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy to be here and I like to welcome you to my studio. This is my universe. This is where I'm happiest. And um, I wanted to share a little gem that I found in my personal archives and it's their heads drawn by another artist. His name is his name is John Fenton, and he was an illustrator and a printmaker. And I was able to purchase um, one of his sketchbooks, which is all heads. And they're drawn with very thin little feathery um, strokes and quilt pens, but I hope you can see some of these. Oops, uh, is this visible? No. Yeah. No. No. So I just want you to know that I love drawing heads and I love other people's drawings of heads. <laughs> wow. So I wanted you to maybe check John Fenton out. These are quill drawings, ink and quill drawings. Mm -hmm. And they're very wonderful. They constantly inspire me. So I have an entire sketchbook of his um, with his drawings. I have those both... things that it's uh, reminiscent of Degas. Yes, he, he's such a fabulous craftsman and he has such a feeling for people when he puts them down on paper. And um, wonderful line quality. Now, the head for me has been a constant in my art. It started with just doing a lot of self portraits as a teenager because I had a lot of angst. <laughs> and it was the easiest, most direct way to draw all of that emotion out of me. When I look back at some of my portraits from that period, I realized that I look so much older and so much more intense. And what happened with me is that the older I got, the lighter my, my heads became. Now there's a piece at the museum that I would like to reference uh, when we do this workshop today. And it's a piece called Caribbean Thoughts Mashup. Um, Olivia, can you show that piece? Yeah. yeah. This piece is a digital image which incorporates an oil painting with a sculpture. The sculpture by itself is, is wonderful, but together this piece really satisfy a desire I've had for a lot of years. Sometimes I have found that some of the visual and emotional goals that I've had take a lifetime to get to. This particular image really started in 1975 in my thoughts. I wanted to create an image where the background and the foreground were the same. And it really had to do with my idea of that, we really walk around with our geographical references, meaning where you come from impacts how you see the world. And I wanted to interpret that visually. And I tried for years, watercolors, drawings, pencil, pastels, photography, I tried everything until this image came along and I thought, there it is. So heads for me really do speak to a person's interior, their, their inner identity and feelings. So let's begin with that. When you draw a head, a lot of people 
focus only on the face. The face is a tiny space in the head. What I would invite you to do, and this is something I do myself, is to really touch your face. Touch your forehead. Come all the way around. Do you feel how solid this form is? Come all the way back to your neck. It's a large form. The face is small. However, this is where the expression is. The other thing I want you to understand about the head is that it moves as a unit. It moves as a unit. My hand articulates any way I want it to. My fingers articulate individually. They move together. My wrist moves. This is one of the most complex forms in the body is your hand because of the way it moves. The head only moves at the jaw up and down and your eyes open and close. That's it. The neck helps you to turn it and you get a little bit of variation, but it's a mess. All right. So I had asked that you look at calendar images or photographs, things that make you feel good, places that you relate to. I have some great calendars and I had images like this, the desert, lakes, rocky mountains, and of course my favorite, a beach. <laughs> what I would like you to do is to choose one of those places that feels good. And I would invite you to put some glue in the back of those images all the way across the edge. And then to glue it onto a board. This is the image that I chose and I glued it onto foam. I did that because foam core is hard. You don't have to have the same materials as I, but I want you to understand the process. When I glued it on, I then cut off all around the edge so that the image bleeds. That means it goes off the edges. I don't see any borders. I also just folded what was left because I don't need that in the image, but structurally, it'll hold it up on my desk like this. All right, stop me if you have a question. I don't want to go too fast. Of course. I see that Sarah Linda has done a virtual version of the workshop already. <laughs> She's sort of cheating. <laughs> no, I'm not glued on, but but it's there. <laughs> it's fun. It really is. So I have in front of me a mirror. And I placed it so that I can see myself. You could use a magazine head, you know, a beautiful fashion head from Vogue or a photograph, but your image should be large. Don't work from something teeny weeny weeny. It's very hard to scale it up. It's easier to scale it down. Okay, so I like drawing from life. So I'm going to draw myself because I'm always available. <laughs> 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 
to model. <laughs> so I'm gonna use some markers. I like testing my markers to see how wet they are and what their color is. Even though I'm using black, I get to see that this particular marker is a good wide width and it's also juicy. Right next to that, I'm gonna try my thin marker, which is also juicy, but it gives me a more delicate line. You see? And this is my medium marker. Now, why am I using marker? I'm using marker because I can't erase it. <laughs> and I want you to be bold that way. When you're learning how to draw form, you're just repeating the form over and over again until you feel comfortable. You're not trying to do it perfectly the first time or the second time or the third time. You're just practicing. So I'm going to start with my lightest marker just to set the location and the basic form of the head. Now, if I go from under my nose to the top of my head, that is a circle. So I'm gonna represent that. And I'm just gonna draw a circle. Now, my wrist is in place, but it's not stiff. I'm not like holding my pen like this. I'm actually, it's a very soft hold. I'm gonna draw a circle to the best of my ability and then I'm gonna go for my mandible. If you put your fingers here and you open and close your mouth, you can feel the bow, the joint moving. I'm gonna go from the side of my circle and I'm going to draw a line down on both sides. I'm gonna go, here we go. That represents my mandible. And then I need to have a place for my jaw. So I'm gonna to go to the sides of my mandibles and just kind of pull in a, gently pull in a jaw. Now, the chin, I like representing it like with a, an egg. Now, these are just placeholders. All of this is going to shift as we get into the particulars of the face. we can draw a line in the center of the head to represent the middle. That orients me a whole lot. So I'm drawing a line right down the middle. Now, the next guideline I'm gonna give myself is the top of the eyebrows. So when I go to my circle, I'm going to put a marker, just a reminder where the hairline might be. So I'm gonna go like this and say, well, maybe the hairline is here. Meaning then from here to here is my bone. And on top of that, I'm gonna have hair, but I'm not, got it. I'm not going to get into that yet. So we're going to, from the tip of the head to the beginning of the hairline. Just a suggestion. Now, most faces, you know, the hairline will follow the side of the circle. So it's gonna gently come in like this. And now I want to locate my eyebrows. 
I don't know if you can see, I have a big forehead, big, lot of this, this is like a lot of real estate right here. So being that that's the case in my head, I'm going to bring my eyebrow, my line to there. Then I want to identify where the ends of my eyebrows are. I'm going to go to the end of this line and do two little marks. I say, okay, it's that line. Now I'm going to come to the point where the circle meets the midline. And I'm going to say that's where my nose is going to be. And then I'm going to do another line right here. It says, oh, my mouth is going to be here. And now I'm going to look at my triangle. Some people have narrow faces. Their triangle is going to be narrow. Some people have wide faces. My face is kind of wide. So my triangle is going to be wide. So I'm going to identify the fact that I have a wide triangle and just draw connecting lines. Now, I'd like to look at this space right here. Outside of my nose and the beginning of my eyes. And I'm going to say, well, maybe I have this much space between my nose and the beginning of my eyes. And all I'm going to do here is suggest that there's going to be an eye here. Now, I'll tell you why I'm putting shadow there. A little bit of shadow. If we look at our heads, it's like steps. The forehead comes out, the eyes go in. The cheekbone comes out, the lower cheekbone comes in. The nose comes out, then it goes in. The upper lip comes out, then it goes in. The lower lip comes out. Then it goes in, the chin comes out, then you go in. Every time the steps go in, you have a shadow because the light is going on the areas that come out, on the planes that come out. You see the nose has a lot of light. So I'm going to just suggest that there's shadow under my nose, shadows where my eyes are, Shadow in my upper lip. This is all general. Shadow underneath my lower lip. Again, just following the steps. I'm going to have shadow where the hair goes out. And definitely shadow underneath the chin. Lots of shadow because the jaw protrudes and it's protruding, receiving light, and then it tucks under. So if you think about the steps in and out, in and out, it'll help you understand where the shadow goes. If any of you have questions while I'm doing all of this, please feel free to ask. Now, this is all genetic. I'm just doing placeholders. If I take my line from the top of my eyebrow and drop it a little bit to the outside, it's going to give me a location for my ears. And if I go below the nose on either side, It'll give me the lower part of the ear. So my ears are going to be here. So what I have now is a roadmap that says, oh, now I can build a head. Now, my cheekbones are high. They come out and then come. 
I squished my face. <laughs> they come out and then they go in. So I'm going to suggest with my light marker that there is a cheekbone here. I'm going to do that. And I'm going to suggest that this is going to be a shadow. And then I'm going to start looking at myself a little more carefully. And by that, I mean, how, how does my face turn when it defines the hair? So now I'm doing two things. I'm trying to find this angle and I'm also trying to say, oh, but there's hair there. So this is what this is doing is defining my hairline. Each one of us has different hairline and it absolutely describes a lot of the character of your face, the frame. And the frame is the hairline. So I'm going to pay a little more attention to my own hairline. And it does come in a little tiny little widow's peak there. And I'm gonna pull that back. And then I have this very wide side over here. But, you know, it gets, my hair starts to pull in this way and it's growing over my ear. So what I'm going to do now is just kind of quickly suggest the shape of my hair. The hair is going to be on top of the cranium, which is what the circle represents, right? So here's my cranium, right? Here's the cranium, but the hair is above it. Do you see that? Here it is. It's above it. So I'm going to suggest that my hair, which is curling, is above, and I have to get myself in the mirror here, that it's above uh, the circle that we drew. Now, it's, what I'm looking for is, well, how long is my hair? And um, what does it do at the tips? Mine has fun tips, you know, because they, you know, it's curly. And I'm gonna say, okay, well, this is gonna go here. I have some hair growing over my ears and I'm just gonna suggest this. Now, and maybe that's too long or too short, but it gives me something to work with. If you look at your hairline, you're going to see shadow. I can see shadow right here. Okay, so I'm going to suggest in the drawing that there's this shadow there and that there's shadow here as the hair touches the face. And I'm just going to make suggestions. So, oh, you know what? Your hair grows that way. Okay. So now I'm going to get a little more specific about my cheek. So I, I have the cheekbone that comes up and then the shadow that comes below it. But right here, I want to look at exactly what does that look like? You know, is it straight? Is it rounded? Is it an old? What is that shape? So I'm trying to find that shape. And then below it is the beginning of my jaw. So I'm going to caress this line. I'm going to hold my marker really loose in my hand. And I'm going to caress this line. Now I'm going to go around my chin. So my chin is marked, right? I have the chin here, but I'm beginning to have a better contour of my face. So I blocked myself here very quietly, and now I'm going to walk myself down the other side. What I'm looking at here is, if this is the edge of my eye, how far is the edge of my eye from my frame, from my hairline? I'm going, oh, you know what? They're pretty close. And then I'm going to work my way up gently and say, okay. Now, 
as I come down, I see my cheekbone. So I want to give acknowledgement to that shape. And I'm going to give myself a little shadow again to say, okay, there's the form. But where does my jaw meet the cheekbone? So I'm going to take it slowly around there. Okay, so now this is start, it's starting to, to be more than just a generic reference. My eyebrows, they're bushy in, in the beginning. So I'm just gonna suggest that I have, you know, some bushy brows and then it gets thin. They get thin towards the end. Okay, so here I'm gonna do a little bushy and then thin towards the end. Those are the brows. Now, I'm going to look at my eyes. I have a soft lid, then a hard lid, then inside of it is the eye. So the eye, the eye is a ball with four muscles in it. And in the middle is our, our iris. <laughs> and then the skin, which forms our lid, wraps around that ball. So when you're drawing an eye, you want to be aware that there's a, a ball underneath it and a ball below it. So you are drawing your lines with the awareness that there's a circle there. Now, when you have planes, right? The planes that move away from the light are gonna be in shadow. I hope you can see what I'm doing here. So when I come here, I'm going to be thinking about, okay, I have that circle. And I'm going to slowly pull the lid over my eye. So I'm coming up, I'm going across. Then I'm going to wrap around the other side. Here I can see the side of my eyeball and a little tear duct. Then the lower lid touches the iris. In my case, the iris is below the lower lid and it's also below the upper lid. I'm going to gently just pull these lines around the circle. When I look in my eye, there is a highlight. So I'm gonna give myself a little shape for a highlight. And then there is a dark circle around it. It's my iris. And the rest of my eye is brown. So it's going to have some color in it not too dark. So I'm happy with my inner lid. So now I'm gonna draw the outer lid. The outer lid is folded skin. So I have a lot more darkness there. So I'm gonna take my darker marker and just indicate that there's more shadow there. Okay. So now the softer upper lid. Then at the end of my bone, where the bone ends, you can touch your side bone there and then you can feel the other plane. 
the edge is going to round out. So I could stay on the eye all day, but we're not because we need to get to the nose. Now the nose has a very sharp frontal plane. And each one of us has a different shape in that frontal plane. So I'm going to suggest the bottom of my nose is soft. It's not a highly structured no. nose. So I'm gonna do a softer, yeah. the bottom of my nose. And then there's that lip, that, that plane that goes underneath. And I'm going to say, okay, there's a plane that comes underneath. And then I have these nostrils. Uh, I don't know, I think they're kind of funny looking, but that's just me. Um, I have these funny nostrils and a soft edge to my nose. And do my nostril here, a little line, and then I'm going to come underneath the line and come up to make a soft nostril. And then I want to get to the bridge of my nose, which is where all the light is being received. And I'm doing that with very feathery little lines. And I'm going to suggest the planes that are on the side because the nose has the front and then two sides. It's like a triangle, right? So they're coming down. Once I've drawn one eye, I literally just bring my hand across to the other side to help me locate the other eye because I don't want one eye higher than the other. So I'm going to say, hmm, if I go to here, and if I go to here, I just use it as a guide. And it helps me orient my second eye. So here I have the middle of that plane and I have my pupil, which is looking at the mirror. And I know that my bottom lid is hiding the tip of my eye. This is the line for the circle. That is the eyeball, and I'm going to bring this line down to suggest my tear duct. And then wrap this side plane around the circle, the ball of the eye. I'm going to leave a little highlight for the eye highlights. Then I'll put in my pupil and suggest that my eyes are brown and I'm going to then look at my lid. So I have a double lid here. I have a second one above that. And then from the tip of my brow to the other side, to the bottom of my eye, there's that circular kind of change of plane. Okay, now the forehead, in my forehead, I can see that the top part of my head is pretty rounded and I am just going to trust that and bring it around. Now, from that shape, that rounded shape, I have shadow on the side. So I'm gonna bring this marker gently around it I have a huge mole right here. I'm just gonna put it in for fun. <laughs> and um, let me get a little bit. Now on the side of the nose, it's just a little more shadow, all right? In my case, I'm older, so I've got these lines pulling on this side. Now, right here in between your lips, this is little valley. So it goes, it's a shadow, it's a little valley. And that shadow forms the middle of your lips. Okay? 
So now I'm going to start to use that point to start creating my lips. So my lips are full and I'm going to find the high point and it's, it's like a little peak. This is like a soft mass that protrudes from your lips, comes out. So I'm gonna say, well, this is a mass that comes out. And then for me, I find the high point of the lips. And then I just, and I know where it's supposed to end. I just gently wrap the form, bring it to the corner. The lower lip in some people like myself tends to be below the upper lip. So the upper lip receives more light. The lower lip is going to be in shadow. However, the shape that receives light, it, it's like an oval, a long oval. So in my case, I'm going to say, well, yeah, I received light there. And then I'm going to stop talking so I can see the line. I'm going to pull from the edge of that mass to the corner. Just going to pull a gentle line to there. And now I'm going to shape my chin. The chin is rather, oh, it's an oval. And I'm going to make a correction here. So the chin is coming out. So it's going to receive light. Then as it tucks in underneath, it's going to be in shadow. Okay. So now making a correction, I'm saying, well, my other chin that was the guideline was a little too long. So I'm just gonna take it in. Okay, I'm just going to darken my lips. The line between the lips has a lot of character. It's, a, it's like your hairline. It's very individual. It's important on each person's face. And um, I'm gonna stop talking so I can see mine. Take your time with that line. It's not a simple line. It goes in, comes out of forms. Then you wanna see how it ends in the, in the corners. My corners are kind of straight. And that needs to be corrected right there. All right. This needs to be corrected. So I'm simply gonna redraw that line. You're just gonna redraw it. No. The ear is behind, it's in one of the planes that's on the sides and it's tucked in. So it's gonna be in shadow. But it has a low, you know, has a ridge at the top. My ears are kind of small. And um, I want to place them where they're supposed to be first. Draw my ridge. Tuck them in. Come around and do a low. Now let's see. I am wearing a turtleneck. So I want, I'm actually not seeing much of my neck at all. 
but I want to suggest the folds of the turtleneck. Coming around the neck. I'm wrapping the fabric around the neck at the top. It needs to touch and come around. And I can pull my line. I go, whoa, pull that. Pull that. So I want to suggest where my shoulders are going to be. I don't know how much of this drawing I will need to fit into my environment, but I want to say, hey, there are shoulders here. So I go to the edge of my turtleneck, which is an, ex an extension of my neck, and I pull. Now I'm gonna take a look at it. And I'm just going to play around with the shape. Now I'm going to switch to my heavier um, marker and start reworking the hairline. And I'm going to suggest, let me see, let me look at this. I'm going to suggest that my hair is actually not this long. That my head is actually smaller than, I'm, than my guidelines. And I've got these curls working. When you have curly hair, it's a little, you're finding the volume is a little trickier because of all the different areas that receive light and dark. So I'm going to find my way through this, like say, okay, this is a shadow, but in order for it to work, it needs to come up against the line of the face. Otherwise, it's not relating to it, okay? Those of you who have straight hair, you're going to have planes that are going to be in dark. Then as it rises up towards the light, you're going to reach a highlight. And as it turns, it's going to be a medium. And then when it curls back in, it's going to be dark again. So you're going to have an undulating um, highlight. Okay, so I've got something going on here and I'm going to say, okay, this is curly hair. Let me give you some texture, but it has to have structure and we're gonna bring it down from what it was before, but you know, what happens at the edge of my hair? So I have some gray hair and it's a, a sort of a, a new challenge for me, interpreting gray and salt and pepper hair with a marker with curly hair. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> so what's important to me right now is just to understand my edge. Where is my hair ending? Because I know that out here it's a little too far. And what I need is something a little tidier and a little more pulled together. So, I come down to the turtleneck. Because it's touching up against the skin, it's going to create a shadow. And come underneath my chin here and clarify that form. It's here, I'm going to darken some areas in my eyes where the eyelashes are. I do not draw the eyelash. I just create 
the shadow that is there to give the eye some depth. With a darker marker, I can get my areas filled in much more quickly, but it's better for me when I draw to do that as a second step, not the first. Like here where my eyebrows are, there's an area where it's darker and just a couple of marks there will bring it to me, bring the darkness to the form. Don't be afraid to ask questions. I do have earrings on, so it might be fun to put them on. Here's my ear, which I drew before. The earrings um, are a geometric shape. Where's the other one? The other one is falling differently. And I want to give it a mechanical form because it's up against a natural form which is a human head. You know, this probably doesn't look anything like me, but I hope it's helping you understand how to organize a head. Now let's see, here I have some dark, Where's my big marker? Yeah, let's get this turtle next. Let's give it some fat, dark lines. I like pulling my line. What that means is I push hard when I apply it. And then as I'm moving away, I lift it. Push hard and I lift, push hard, and I lift. And it gives me a much more spontaneous line. And this uh, marker allows for more feathering application. And um, it will get to our forms in a very different way. It doesn't have so much of a handwriting. It's more like a brush. And sometimes in some areas, it's just good to tie it all together, meaning I'm just flicking. I go to the edge, I put my marker down and I flick. I'm flicking. And it fills in random areas. Olivia, how are we doing for time? We actually have about a half hour left. I was going to text you in a moment. Um, okay. But I've just been mesmerized, so I'm sorry I haven't been talking that much. You don't need to talk. <laughs> I, will, I will call you and say what's happening. So, <laughs> Um, you know, I'm in my studio and I have all kinds of supplies here. So you may not have all this stuff in here, but I'm going to see what happens if I get a white pencil. Hmm. I don't know. White pencil, will that work? Let's see. What?
I would I want a white pencil? Sometimes, sometimes I just want a clean highlight. Let's see, can I get it? Yeah, maybe, maybe. I'm not sure it's going to do what I want it to do. Oh, maybe it will. <laughs> I'm going into the highlight in the eye and just giving it a cleaner shape with a tip of a very sharp white pencil. Going in here. I'm going to go in here. It's like the black marker, which unifies the dark areas. A sharp white will clean up the highlights. See, so I'm drawing on, I am drawing on tracing paper. I think my shadow area needs underneath the neck needs to be darker. Make that darker. I'm using the mid size marker. Darker around the turtleneck. Also darker. Here. Well, as I said, I don't know if this really truly looks like it, but I want you to get the idea. Let me see. I may get all crazy here, and I have been known to ruin a drawing more than once. <laughs> because at the end, I get crazy and I go, Oh, what happens is, you know, if you take this all the way out and become more of a salt and pepper look, maybe. <laughs> and you, you've got some curls in here, but can you pull them in? I don't know if it makes any sense. That's really how I think. I'm thinking that in my head. Like, yeah, but you got some shadows in there. And, you know, you're not really articulating the shadows and you want to get in there, da -da -da, whatever. So how do you know when to stop? I'm going to stop now because I'm making <laughs> that, wrong. that, you know, I do talk to myself and yeah. as I'm talking, I'm like, all right, that's enough. <laughs> so even though this head in reality doesn't look like me, I'm grateful that I have my own head to give me references, but what I wanted more than anything, more than a likeness, I wanted all of you to have an idea of how to build a head, any head. You know, so I'm going to stop because I think this drawing has enough information on it to do what I want it to do. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to take it off of this little pad. And I'm going to see how it relates. How is it related to my landscape here? What happens if I like it with less, I like it on a diagonal. So you have the freedom to do what I'm doing, which is, well, how do you want it placed? Well, I kind of like it more on the diagonal than I do straight on. What that means is this line here, I'm not happy with it if I'm going to do a diagonal. So I'm going to have to clean that line up. Nope. Where's my marker? Nope. I need the right marker. The, the right marker. So I'm going to just pull this line. Now, I encourage you to take your drawing and choose a position for it in your environment.
So I am going to position mine in this way. Now that I have that, I'm going to get my trusty scissors and start cutting. First thing I'm going to cut. I'm going to cut around my lines. Now, whether you use tracing paper or watercolor paper or regular sketchbook, whatever you have, doesn't matter. I, when I cut, I keep my scissor in one place and I move the paper around the scissor so that the scissor, all I have to do with my scissor hand is gently cut. See, with all these curls, I have to go in and out and in and out. And in and out. I'm just going to manipulate the paper. Manipulate the paper around the scissors. And I want to stay as close to the line as I can. If you cut something off, you can glue it back on or tape it back on. It doesn't matter. What we want is to see what the drawing looks like without the extra paper. Here, I know that the paper's going to be folded. I'm just going to get rid of that. And before I make a decision about whether or not to cut the extra paper that goes around the form, I'm just going to fold it with my finger to give it a clean fold. There we go. I'm going to go to where I fold it. And now I'm going to rehearse again. So I'm going to cut the bottom completely off because I have this edge and I don't want to deal with the paper there. But I didn't know that until I rehearsed. Cut at the edge. Don't need this. Yes, okay, it's going to be like this. What about the sides? Do I want them on or off? Hmm, let me see. I'm going to fold it in, fold it over. See how that feels. Hmm. Do I mind that? I don't mind that. I don't mind that. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do going to cut a little corner here where the paper meets. And then I'm going to take my glue stick here's a scrap piece of paper take my drawing on the back and I'm going to use regular old glue stick from school. Wherever it is that you get it. And I'm going, the most important thing really is that when you apply it, that you apply it over the edge, over all of your edges. That is the most important part. You don't want to glue only inside. 
because then it'll make it difficult to adhere the odd shape. So first, make sure it goes over all your edges. Then, once I know I have that, I usually go down the middle a couple of times, go down, go down. I'm doing long strokes here. And then, hey, I might do some horizontals just for safekeeping. And make sure that I feel like, okay, it's pretty tacky. You know, this will attach. All right, so now that I've got glue on my drawing, how I lay it down is important. So I'm going to find my corner. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to lay the drawing on my sleeve so it doesn't go on incorrectly. If it does, it doesn't matter. I'm going to find my corner, which helps me with my position. I'm going to do the upper edge first. I'm pulling on the drawing gently so it's not sticking all at once. I'm going to do that edge to anchor it. I'm still not gluing the middle. Doing the other edge to anchor it. And now I'm going to work my way from the corner. I'm going to gently, this is very gentle. I'm just suggesting that it go down. Okay, now that I have it in the position that I want, I'm going to go horizontally from side to side like this. I see some bubbles here. I'm going to do a little circular motion. This is not gluing very well. So I'm going to have to make another decision. And the decision is it's coming off. <laughs> not working. I'm taking it off. Here we go. I'm going right up against the edge of the board. And I'm cutting. Don't ever get upset with yourself. You know, you make a mistake, just toss it. Do it again. I used to teach at the Altus de Chabon School of Design in the Dominican Republic. And I taught figure drawing and anatomy to the freshmen. And to this day, to this day, years later, they are still teasing me about my anatomy classes because when we got to the hands, I made them draw 100 hands in a week, numbered. And they were terrified of that homework. But it's the only way they could learn how to draw the hands. Oh, I had them, I would count each hand in each student's <laughs> journal and say, you're missing five hands, get them back to me. <laughs> you know, some forms, some things is the only way to learn. Yeah. You repeat. Mm -hmm. I remember I had an art teacher one time and they always said, draw what you see and not what you know. Exactly. Um, and it was always a process of drawing things over and over again until it was like drawing what I saw. And I remember that, you know, but I, something I learned and uh, I still use when I do art now. You know, getting out of your own way when you're drawing is really important which is what draw what you see is about. Mm -hmm. what, are you, what are you looking at? You know, and 
don't get fussy about it. I mean, I, I may go out, I mean, I can look into this and say, you know, that really doesn't look like me, but I'm not gonna like suffer over it. Uh, I'm hoping that one that I do where I'm not talking and looking at the camera will look more like me, but here's the final product. Mm -hmm. Wow. Here's the final product. What I liked about the idea of the tracing paper is that it allows a little bit of transparency with the image that's below it. Mm -hmm. in a, and it creates a simple kind of mashup. If you chose to use a matte paper, it will still work. I am enjoying the idea of transparency these days. So I chose that paper. Now, mm -hmm. if you do this again, you will feel more comfortable. I showed you several of the calendar themes and environments. I may do another one. They're small, they're easy. For me, this could be like a sketch for another idea. How do I make something like this work? I love squares. I work in squares a whole lot. Yeah. I may add a little bit of paper here so it doesn't feel yeah. Let me just show you how I would handle this. I would say, okay. Well, um, I need for this to continue. I'm just going to go over the line here and um, start bringing it down. And we'll see what that does. So I'm going to tell myself where to cut. It's going to be here and here. I'm just going to add that little corner. Things. I have a recycling bin in the studio <laughs> and I toss a lot of stuff in there <laughs> because you have to enjoy what you're doing, be relaxed with it, and have a sense of humor. Sometimes someone else will come in and go, why did you throw this out? And I said, because it doesn't work. So I'm throwing it out. Okay, so let's see. I'm gonna add, if I add that, does that make it look, how does that work? I kind of like it. Oh, but I kind of don't. So I think what I'm going to do is improvise. I'm gonna rip this paper here. That's what I didn't like was the edge. Okay, that's better. I like, can you see this? I like that better than the square. So what I'm going yeah. to continue to improvise with is I'm going to take my marker and draw out here. See what have I got? Oh yeah. Okay. I put a pattern on there and I ripped the paper to get rid of the hard edge and the line helps me incorporate it into the background. There we go. So I am personally happier with it than I was before. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, 
Now I can look at it and say, well, if you want to make any more changes, it's time to do another one. Because you're going to overcook it. And yeah. it should have some spontaneity. It should have some sense of, oh, I sketched this, I made some decisions. And now whatever other ideas I have, I'll have to do on the next one. Mm -hmm. Let me see yours. Okay. One second. Come on. Let me see that one. What is going on? <gasps> Look at you. Yeah. So exciting. I decided to do the hair just because I feel like hair is a really big part of my identity. Yes, it is. You know, I Mom, feel like it's a different true color. for a lot of people. Yeah, I'm always changing my hair color. So. <laughs> That's fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> so Does now, anybody else want to share their work yeah, while we are live? Let me see. I want to see your pieces. Oh, look at that. I can see more people now. Yeah. Um, okay. Diane, I can see you. Show me your piece. <laughs> <laughs> me <laughs> it's wonderful to see you lee show me your pictures i would like to see also i'm going to put up um our last slide here um <laughs> so the email at the bottom of this page um there we go. The email at the bottom of this uh, slide is um, the link that you can send your finished products to if you would like to share them with the museum and uh, have them potentially shared on social media. Um, we love seeing all of the work that everyone does in these workshops and it's uh, kind of creates an art community um, mm -hmm. at the museum that we really just enjoy having and uh, experiencing with you guys. Mm -hmm. So do we have any questions? I have a question. Yeah, um, hi. Am, I, am I, yeah, I am unmuted. Um, I wear glasses all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I drew with, I put the glasses in and they, the glasses always seem to look I don't know, funny to me. They're not, but I can't really see myself if I'm not wearing them. So you're Diane, right? Hi, yes. Diane. Yes. So what you would do is exactly what we did together. Mm -hmm. However, on top are the glasses. Mm -hmm. so you're going to draw the glasses as a, as a second structure. Mm. The glasses tend to come beyond the head a little bit. You know where, where they fold, where the hinges are? Mm -hmm. The hinges are going to come out here. Right. And you want to feel that shape, but on top of right. what's already there. So if I was drawing glasses, they would come to here, and then they... they for sure, back into the air. So mm -hmm. it's not straight. They, they're coming in. And they're also, look, if these are my glasses, do you see how much shadow they cast in my eyes? Mm -hmm. Without the glasses, with the glasses. So once the shape is on top of the face, you're going to add extra shadow underneath the lenses mm -hmm. and sometimes like if the glasses come out to here mm -hmm. they'll be light coming through that bottom part right because the glasses go like this and your face goes like this right so you want to be aware that you may have light in the corner of your glasses so you're, you're drawing them as a second shape, but on top of the structure. Okay. okay. Thank you. 
Thank oh, you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You should try it. You can take I will it. try it, yes. <laughs> yeah, try it. Just see what that feels like. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Julia. Yes. Um, I think that we are, oh, let me stop sharing so we can see each other. Um, we're pretty much at time. If anyone, does anybody have any other questions? No? <laughs> okay. So uh, is, there, is there any closing thoughts or anything you want to end uh, this program on for us? Well, I, I just want to thank you for taking the time. I think the museum is serving a very important purpose at this time when we're all separated from each other, from classes, from the ways that we're used to sharing. So I feel that this format is very important in creating a community and in keeping us connected. And, and for me in particular, reminding me of the joy of sitting at a desk and doing something in a very direct and simple way. My message to all of you besides that, which is to stay with each other, you know, do drawing Zooms, you know, do co you know, coffee hour Zooms, talk about your work. I was very blocked with the pandemic and everything that was happening. I had not created a thing since February. And literally about two weeks ago, that's all it took. I started to do little sketches with you know, people that I saw on Zoom, literally, because I was on a lot of meetings, I would draw them. Good and I began to draw that way. And all of a sudden, that block moved and I was able to continue some unfinished pieces. Uh, I'll show you. Do you see the gold leaf panels there? Mm -hmm. um, there are five panels. That I, I just couldn't move. And now, because I've been doing little sketches, and this is what I did. I told a couple of friends, I'm blocked. When I draw something, I'm going to send it to you by iPhone. And you tell me what you think. So I started doing that, just sending a little Zoom sketch and sending a little this sketch. And my friends would make me accountable. And that really helped me. And they said, oh, nice gesture. Oh, yeah, you slapped them some color, fine. Blah, blah, blah. And I thought, well, I'm going to show them today. I've got to do another little sketch. And it was that way that I actually was able to get to the, the very serious, very demanding work. Do that for yourself if you're stuck. Find a friend, make something, email it to them, text it to them. Say, look, well, I did this today and they're going to encourage you and it will help you. Don't be self-critical. The fact that we're all alive and doing anything normal is an extraordinary feat. Please do not be hard on yourselves. Be gentle, be kind, be loving, draw, and keep each other company. And uh, I'd like to thank this museum for understanding the need for this community and for us to stay connected. Well, thank you, Julia. Um, we can't do programs like these without artists who are as wonderful and as dedicated as you. Of course, um, it, this is a uh, really exciting. And Julia is our current teaching artist in residence. If you missed that, so we will be having a few more programs coming up with Julia in the coming months, which we're very excited about, and we're very happy to have you. Um, <laughs> Looking forward to the future for this month, uh, we have a virtual artist talk with Cynthia Daniel tomorrow, um, Postcards from America, that's gonna be at 1.30. We on Wednesday have a uh, program with Labrado Romero from the desert to the river, which is kind of almost like a virtual road trip through our galleries. Um, and then coming up on, uh, I believe the, 22nd Sunday is at 1.30 is the 
virtual talk about the healing power of rue, rosemary, and basil with a Mexican environmentalist, Agar Garcia. And then we'll be having our holiday kickoff um, from Friday to Sunday, November 27th to 29th. So please stop by and uh, thank you for all, all of you for being here. Your attendance and your dedication to our programs are always appreciated and it keeps us going. So everybody have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <Keep going. laughs>